Hi, this is Paul Gibbons, one of two authors of Adopting AI, which is out March 2025. It says, up to the minute, a treatment we think as is available. Uh, one of the loveliest comments uh, offered to us was it strikes a perfect balance between optimism, pragmatism, and caution. Let's see what's in the book. Scenarios, we ask you to consider the why of AI, what's good about it, the what of AI, what it is, and what's coming next in 2025 and beyond for AI. A whole section on adopting AI, strategy, adoption, and learning, and a third section on ethics and governance. As you're reading the book, we want you to consider the scenarios in which way we're heading towards a utopian scenario where AI is benefiting humanity broadly and in important ways, or a dystopian scenario where the opposite is happening. For example, in militarized minds, AI science can be used to develop automated weapon systems, uh, think Terminator, or it can be used to supercharge science. Let's say a little bit now about the most optimistic view of AI and science, because I think that this is the area which is most exciting and most promising. First, uh, if you want to grab the book, there's a QR code and don't forget to like and subscribe on the channel. Before the invention of the microscope, uh, we couldn't see what we couldn't see of the cellular world. Uh, it was invented in about, I think, 1640 by Robert Hooke. And after the invention of it, we saw a whole new world about which we could begin to reason and imagine and create and generate hypotheses. This led to a whole area of scientific discovery called microbiology. The invention of microbiology allowed the development of antiseptic techniques of uh, pasteurization and of antibiotics. And between those three, they'd save two to three billion lives. That's more than any invention before, or dare I say, any invention since. At the bottom of this image, you'll see a, an image taken with an ultraviolet telescope. Before we had telescopes that could see in ultraviolet, we had a very narrow view of the universe. Now we can see unimaginable things and begin, again, to develop hypotheses about what's happening there, and to begin to understand cosmology at that scale. So AI does the same thing, but not in the same way. So if I ask you to imagine a petabyte, 750 billion pages of standard text, or 10 billion Facebook photos, you can't see it. And if the elements of that petabyte are interacting as they are in a climate system, for example, in non-linear causal ways, we can't begin to develop hypotheses that will help us to understand what's going on. Well, AI does that. It can both grasp a petabyte and they could begin to use what we call inductive scientific discovery to develop hypotheses about what's going on in the climate system. So in that way, it's an extra organ and it will open up vistas just as did the microscope and the telescope. All right, that's enough for science nerds. We do talk about the breakthroughs that are coming, not in 2050, but in 2028 or 2030 in all of the basic sciences. And these are truly transformative. Healthcare particularly is one I just wanna to touch on briefly. Um, people say we could double the longevity right now, which in the United States is something like 77 years. Uh, and people say, yeah, we cannot get to live to 144 years old. Don't be stupid. However, that's 154 in fact, if you double that. Longevity approximately doubled between 1900 and today, 2025. So it's not at all out of the question that it could happen again. Uh, and it could happen a lot faster than 125 years. So that's just one of the possibilities. Uh, we touch on many more like that. Some are uh, in the realm of speculation. But, you know, greater thinkers than we are, your authors, um, have put a lot of faith in the ability of science to... Um, be upended by uh, artificial intelligence. Let's get on to some other cases. When we talk about art, there was a famous statement in 1840 that the invention of the photograph would be the end of painting, a famous French thing. And then shortly after that, we had the birth of Impressionism because artists decided, well, we can't do reality as well as a photograph. So let's be create more creative. And so we're born Impressionism and Post-Impressionism and Dadaism, Fatimism and Cubitism and Surrealism and all of the other artistic movements of the 20th century. 
late 19th century, 20th century, were birthed out of this uh, ability to not depict reality as closely as could a photograph. And so rather than killing painting, you could argue that photography, in fact, caused painting to explode in creativity. And we have humor in the book. So this is one of the cartoons from a gentleman called Jonesy. Um, there are several of them. God forbid a business book should have a bit of humor in it. There's several different sidelights like that. I hope you find those as entertaining and enjoyable as you read the book. One of the interesting stories about the development of the AI, we're getting into chapters two and three now, is um, what it did to chess. Now, that may be for many of you, yawn, there's a bunch of nerds talking about chess. The highest ever human chess rating was 2882, Magnus Carlsen, uh, until very recently the reigning world chess champion. Gary Kasparov played um, uh, uh, IBM's Deep Blue in 1987. He called it an alarm clock, and skeptics then thought a computer could never beat a human. But in 1987, we had to eat humble pie, and uh, Deep Blue eked out a win against Garry Kasparov. Um, chess computers began to get better and better, uh, but they were still uh, being taught how to play chess by humans. In other words, we were feeding them our sophisticated understanding of strategy and tactics of opening theory and end game theory and middle game theory and position and all of those sorts of things. What we did in later years with, with uh, what's called Alpha Zero is we didn't teach it to play chess. We told it the bishop moves this way, the rook moves this way, etc. Why don't you teach yourself? And in just a matter of hours, it had played a billion games against itself with trial and error, with what's called reinforcement learning. And lo and behold, in a very short period of time, this was able to beat not just the best humans in the world, but the best bots, one called Stockfish at the time. And now AI chess is rated about 3,500. So as much better at chess as LeBron James is better than me at basketball. Um, and that's all very nerdy and who cares about chess and everything like that. But ask yourself this, what could it teach itself that's more interesting for humanity than just learning to play chess? In other words, given the right, what they call objective function, if we were to say to it, okay, have at it, here are the rules of the game, the problem we're trying to solve in chess, kill the king, but some other more important uh, uh, goal for humanity, what could it teach itself to do? And that's really one of the grounds, I think, for rather a lot of optimism as we move into 2025 and beyond. One of the questions people ask is, will it be evil? And we spend some time thinking about what is the root of human evils? Why do humans, why are we capable of you know, great brutality and evil? And why would a machine intelligence necessarily be the same? There are examples in science fiction of very benign uh, machine intelligences, commander data, and very malign ones uh, with HAL. So these are things that we need to consider as, we're, as we get closer. Uh, as Sam Altman says, we think we've done artificial general intelligence. We're working on artificial super intelligence now. He said that in January of 2025, by the way. Is that a good thing for us? We discussed some of those points. And then finally, in the concluding the what's next for AI, we talk about AI agents, which you've probably, if you pay attention to the news, been hearing a lot about. We talk about the different kinds of agents, the difference between an agent and an LLM, and what they do. So again, a very practical chapter now. And then we move on to AI strategy. We use the um, two examples of Netflix and Kodak, one that prospered in the uh, digital revolution and uh, one that stumbled and fell. Kodak, just to give you an example of the one that stumbled and fell, had 50% of the camera market, camera and other photography related business lines that they had. A 50% market share. They invented the digital camera and they had unmatched access as one of the biggest companies in the world to capital and yet they were broke 15 years later. Now, that's an extraordinary thing if you think about it, because they had an unmatched competitor of advantage then. Why did that happen? And I think there's lessons there for AI adopters too. And why did Netflix, for very different reasons, 
prosper and go from strength to strength because if many of you remember if you're old enough Netflix used to deliver your DVDs through the letterbox if you still have one of those uh, and it was able to pivot and not just get its business model wiped out as did Blockbuster but it was able to prosper in this new digital world so what's happening there talk about AI adoption um, the co-author of mine James Healy's magnificent guy lives in Perth Western Australia we we're both uh, experts in change management and we think change management will not be good enough for AI adoption so what's better we offer a framework called adaptive adoption that's been socialized and vetted and approved and circulated and based on our research with dozens of practitioners who are trying to get AI adoption to have an in workplaces right now so we offer that and then we talk about AI learning what's the learning challenge look like for AI how big is the challenge why is AI learning different than other uh, different uh, technology learning that has to happen why is it different than say learning to use Salesforce and uh, so forth so we then um, proceed on to one more chance to buy the book if you want to click the QR code AI ethics and we talk about three things that are foundational in AI that we can't do very much about one is the alleged theft of intellectual property there's Carrie Fisher Princess Leia with her lightsaber and of course she was dead when this movie was filmed so we were able to use her digital likeness of course actors around the world are now horrified because if we can create accurate digital likenesses of people does it threaten their lives and livelihoods well it's an interesting question and so AI is accused of all that content that it trains on by the way it was created by a human being at some stage right it wasn't just born there for AI to so, so when does scraping when does AI training become theft AI is also opaque we don't really know why it does what it does both when it does brilliant things as in chess or as in beating the world champion at go surprising results and then also stupid things hallucinations we have a hallucinating artificial intelligence there those are interesting properties which make the ethics of AI that opacity really a challenge and there's another phenomenon called emergence we talk into and those are three things about which you can't do very much but business leaders can, can do they have more agency as we put it in other areas of AI one of the uh, ethical AI frameworks that's passed around is responsible AI as we say in the book it was a very good start when it was developed and we need another patch to drop because in our view it's wholly insufficient as a way of looking at AI ethics we look at other ways of looking at AI ethics and I couldn't help but drop in another cartoon about three business people gazing upon the wildfires saying we need to monetize this and quickly so is there a tension between capitalism and AI we ask the question we don't have particular acts to grind there but it's a question that we have to bear in the forefront of our mind and then we talk about the five ethical issues in AI I won't go through them all but cybersecurity is one AI and sustainability is another bias is another and so forth we then get up onto the incredibly complex area of AI law uh, every country every regime has its own different uh, level of regulation the United States effectively is completely unregulated there's no national regula regulation there were executive orders which were quickly rescinded in early 2025 um, <clears throat> and then there's by contrast the European Union has rather the strictest artificial intelligence regulation in the world protecting things like manipulation of children manipulation of human beings those are all you know redlined by we don't have such protections uh, protections from data privacy etc cetera, etc cetera. so you know have the EU gone too far is one question we ask and has the US not gone far enough and that's a review uh, you know it's only 10 pages long and it's a very complex topic but we'll give you a sense of what's happening in AI law and the question we ask you to ask yourself is am I sufficiently protected by the laws in my country and then finally in the last chapter we talk about AI governance and how you put it all together because having a responsible AI framework or an AI alignment framework or other framework to um, at board level which espouses certain ethical principles is useless unless you have a governance function to help give it teeth and we talk about some of the ways in which leading organizations are doing that 
Um, and so there you are. Back to the scenarios again. We asked you to think through the whole book as whether we're heading for breaches and backlash or fairness first, unemployment and unrest or evolution, not elimination, biosphere blowout or planetary progress. And so with that, I'm Paul Gibbons signing off. Uh, my co-author, James Healy, lives in Australia. You can hit him up on LinkedIn. You can do likewise with me. You can go out and grab the book. And we plan on launching some book-related products later in the year. So subscribe and like if you're interested in hearing more about that. Thank you very much.